that would have been bad. Okay, so David, why don't you why don't you just take a moment and kind of uh, get us up to speed on you know kind of what you um, have been doing over the last you know year in the midst of COVID? What some some things that maybe you you talk about your family a little bit, some things that you're looking forward to in 2021 maybe, uh, and uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, thanks, Sean, for the opportunity to be here. Good to see you guys. And um, so my wife and I have three girls. They're 10, 9, and 6. And um, we, just, we just expanded our family this past week by adding a puppy. So our girls have been asking for a dog for a long time. And we've, we've been holding off just because um, we wanted them to be old enough to help out and we knew how much work it would take. And our youngest daughter, our six-year-old, has cerebral palsy, so she requires a lot of attention and time as it is. So just the thought of adding more was always something that we weren't sure about. But just like Friday night, we came home with this puppy. I, I think you might be able to see him. I'll hold up this. Uh, they, he's a rescue dog, so we don't really know his exact breed and mix. We'll probably find out eventually. But um, they said he was a lab retriever, but he looks like a little bit like a beagle to us. Uh, his name's Mickey, and so um, we're just uh, kind of experiencing all that this week. But uh, our family is doing well. You know, uh, we've stayed healthy during the season. Um, my stepdad did just last week test positive for COVID. So now, you know, my mom tested. She tested negative. but She's got to test again, and I'm testing tomorrow. And it's just like this is probably your guys' life, too. Um, we're just testing all the time because we're just constantly exposed the people who end up testing positive. So um, our girls are, are remote right now from school, um, partly because we're just trying to protect them from having to quarantine during Christmas. Um, so it's just crazy time, and I'm not telling you anything that you guys aren't going through as well. Um, so I served as the youth director for New York for seven years, and then since 2018, I've served as the lead pastor of a, a Summit of God Church in Clay, New York, which is a suburb of Syracuse. So we're right in the center of the state, about a four hour drive from New York City. And um, this has been such an interesting year for local church ministry, as you guys know. Um, you know, when you're, uh, when you're trying to make plans and the rules keep changing, um, when you're trying to build a bridge and they keep giving you new materials to build with, um, that's what it's felt like this year. They just kind of spin you, blindfold you and tell you to go do something. And so we've learned a lot this year about um, being flexible a lot this year about um, being humble and gracious um, a lot this year about trusting God in the midst of it all and a lot this year about the importance of the mission that continues no matter what else is happening and so that's kind of where we've been and uh, just thanks for the opportunity to hang out with you guys today yeah man thanks brother I appreciate it and uh, I'll give a little bit of direction uh, I have no problem if you are if you're good with this, David. That if you guys want to kind of chime in and interrupt and ask questions and just kind of, yeah. I want to make it pretty organic. Um, I know that um, it's it's different and weird, somewhat weird on Zoom because um, it's harder, a little bit harder to read the room because there's like 15 rooms. So uh, feel free just to unmute and chime in and and interact and. Um, uh, if I can take a moment just to brag on David a little bit, uh, this is a guy who um, is has incredible humility. Okay, so so uh, those of you who don't know David, it, he he has um, he he's very bright. Um, he's you say that you say smart, and it's like that's washed out, that's watered down. He's very bright. He's very intelligent. Uh, he's very kind and generous and gracious, um, but more than anything, he's very humble and has incredible insight, uh, not just into culture at large, but into the scriptures as a narrative and how, um, how the scriptures actually infuse and permeate all of culture of, over all of time. And uh, there's not a lot of people, men and women, that have that gift. Um, they're, they're out there. I'm not saying David's the only guy and all that stuff, but they're out there. But David is one of them. And uh, we're just uh, really, really glad that he 
uh, loves Jesus and loves his wife and loves his family and, and wants to serve. And, um, and, and he has such a great humility about him. And so, um, we're grateful that you're on bro and really do appreciate it. You taking the time really, really last second, super last second. So, um, the, the topic or theme that I felt like, man, we just kind of hearing a lot about just disappointment, disappointment over and over and over again, uh, with children's men, kids ministry and youth ministry and teenagers and, and elementary age kids, even with like looking at my kids and just as youth workers, as kids workers, um, as the church as a whole, culture as a whole, just this feeling of man let down after let down after let down. And so if you could just kind of talk with us a little bit and you kind of started on it um, there, how, what does it look like for us to abide, to trust Jesus in the midst of uncertainty, uh, in the midst of a lot of um, disappointments and um, how, how might we do that? What does that like look like um, from your perspective, bro? Yeah, and I want to echo what Sean said, not the, not the part where he was bragging on me, but the part about um, uh, if anyone has any thoughts, questions, uh, I love to engage. And I have my chat box open so I can see it. If you guys type anything in or just, or just unmute yourself and shout me down. Um, I, I want this time to be useful to you, ultimately. And so if there's something you've come in on with, if you come into this meeting with something really big on your heart, I want to make sure that we get to hear it and we get to talk about it. But I think, you know, we, we've been walking through, one of the things I remind myself about seasons is that every, the first off, the season is only a season. Um, seasons don't last forever. And every season is different than the previous one and is different than the next one. And, um, you know, just speaking from a um, natural standpoint, different seasons you know you guys live in the same similar climate as I do up here in upstate New York where you experience the four seasons I, I believe um, and different seasons require different things of us so you know in Syracuse where we already have had snow we're bracing for more snow we're going to get 180 inches of snow this winter no problem um, and so come winter uh, the winter season requires me to grab my shovel or my snowblower and be ready but in the summer my shovel is useless now I got to get my lawnmower out, right? So different seasons require different things from us. And I think one of the things that is really important as we lean into what the Spirit is doing is that we just try to be really attentive to the season that God is leading us into. One of the things I tried to challenge leaders with early when COVID first hit and everybody was scrambling is the thought that God, um, God entrusted us to lead in the season. Like this is, this is his sovereign uh, workings that when he laid the foundations of the earth, he knew that you and I would be on this Zoom call uh, he knew that you and I would be going through 2020 trying to figure out how to keep our heads above water, how to engage with youth, how to care for families, how do you disciple from a distance. Like, I think uh, when the Sunday morning service is gone, which, you know, has become this massive, maybe too big part of our discipleship process, then what are we left with? And how do we, re how do we, how can we still be faithful to the mission and still be the people of God when all the programs and all the vehicles that we've created to get things done are gone. And that's kind of how it's felt this year, but it's been helpful for me to just remind myself that God, even though I don't feel like in me, I have the answers. Um, you chose me to lead in this season. And in a lot of ways, what God has asked us to do didn't change because of COVID. Ultimately our mission is to make disciples. And so one of the things that we've had to do in the season is lean into this challenge of what does it look like to make disciples when we can't gather regularly, when we can't be together, when we can't go to kids' sporting events, when we can't visit them at their jobs because they're not doing any of this stuff right now. And so um, I think, you know, one of the things I talk to leaders about a lot is the danger of falling in love with solutions versus falling in love with the problem. When we fall, you know, as leaders, we are always coming up with solutions, ways to address problems. But today's solution is actually going to be the next generation's problem if we hold on to it too long, right? There's this story in the Old Testament where the Israelites are in the wilderness and they're grumbling and they're complaining and God sends these fiery serpents to begin to attack them. And he tells Moses and Aaron, hey, if you want to stop this, make a bronze serpent and lift it up. And if they look at it, they'll be healed and delivered. 
And it's an incredible moment where God provides this deliverance for his people from the very punishment that he sent to them, which is a foreshadowing, of course, of what he's done for us in Christ. And as Moses lifts up the serpent and they look at the serpent, they look and they live, uh, which is a foreshadowing of the gospel, that as we look to Jesus at the, on the cross, we can look and live. Well, a few hundred years later, King Hezekiah has to destroy that same serpent. And the reason why Hezekiah has to destroy that serpent is because by then, Israel had begun to worship that serpent. It had become an idol. They fell in love with it. And so what, what happened was that what, what God used in one generation to bring deliverance, in another generation, it became a source of bondage because they held on to something and they worshiped the thing instead of the God who gave them the thing. And, and you know, the danger in this season is that we just are biding our time till we can get back to our old solutions. And maybe God is asking us to walk away from some of our old solutions. And maybe he's saying, here's the problem. People, don't, people need to love me. They need to know me. They need to follow me. They need to be in community. They need to live lives of purpose and passion. They need to bear my image well. They need to do good work. Uh, they need to advance the kingdom. And if that means that we don't get to have our 75-minute youth service on a Friday night, then that's a solution that may have worked for a long time but isn't working this year and maybe it's not something we should all run back to super fast as soon as we can if we haven't taken the time to ask the question what are the best solutions in this day and age to help students follow jesus love jesus serve jesus so i think this season in some ways and i say this knowing that people have lost so much you know new york i don't know what it's, i'm sorry i haven't really tracked oregon numbers i'm not 100 percent sure how COVID has affected you guys. But New York was at the sort of the spearhead of it initially, you're probably aware. Um, then things sort of calmed down for us and now they're ratcheting back up. Um, and, you know, we're losing, we're losing people. You know, I mean, we're not just, people aren't just getting sick. People are, are dying um, all the time. And so, um, you know, this is a season where I'm not making light of it when I say this, but I do think to some extent we have to look at everything that we receive as a gift from God. There's grace in it. And there's a way in which God can use this season to shape us, to cause us to question old solutions, to expose what I think in the American church has been an over-dependence on the Sunday morning service for the purpose of disciple making. And I'm for the Sunday morning service. I'm a lead pastor. I got to have it. I love it. I look forward to it. But when churches can't make disciples anymore because they simply can't gather together for an hour on a Sunday morning, I think we've put all our eggs in one basket and it's been exposed during this season. And so, um, you know, those are some of the things that I've kind of been wrestling through as a leader as I've been asking God, what are you asking us to do during this season? Um, someone just sent me a message about how do we, how do we deal with inward health? I'm sure like many of us, this has been an emotional roller, roller coaster, not feeling like you're impacting. Yeah, I think um, this is a great question. I know this is part of why we're here. And one of the things that I would say is that in some ways the answer hasn't changed, um, but in some ways I think there's some things unique about right now. Um, one of the things I'm finding is that, or one of the things that I've found, and I've been in Somebody's of God my whole life. My dad and my mom are Somebody's of God ministers, and I've always worked in the Somebody's of God church. Generally speaking, some of the God believers are not taught well on certain spiritual disciplines. Like we're taught a lot about um, praying, giving, fasting, reading our Bibles, going to church, going on mission trips. We're not taught well about things like solitude, um, silence, meditation in, in a healthy sense of that word, in a biblical sense of that word, um, lament. Uh, you know, those are not things that we're fluent at. And I'm speaking broadly, of course, some of you maybe are. But generally speaking, Pentecostals are not known for being quiet and shutting up and listening. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, I guess I can make that joke because I've been in this tribe my whole life. Uh, but I think one of the things I've, I've had to do in this season is slow myself down. Even though everything did feel like it slowed down, the whole world can slow down around you but it doesn't mean your mind slows down and it doesn't mean your heart slows down. In fact, the slowdown of COVID probably ratcheted up our minds and our hearts. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that especially in the, in the category of mental health uh, and emotional health challenges that we're at a 
massive crisis. And actually, I think I might have read an article that was about a study in Oregon that said the mental health, um, depression, anxiety, that crisis is three to four times uh, that what it normally is right now. And of course, the holiday season is, is a peak for um, for self-harm and suicide and, and, and uh, anxiety and depression. So, you know, fi finding time to kind of slow my mind down, center on God's word, lay, lay aside what I had as a kid, which was this sort of ambitious achievement-based spiritual discipline focus, which is I'm going to read through the Bible as fast as I can and just allow a few verses to just kind of sit with me over the course of the day and just um, meditate on that, pray into that, ask the spirit to speak to me through that and just slow down, listen, be quiet, get alone, turn the news off. Man, you know, I've, I had to challenge my church all year long. I mean, this year was COVID was one thing, but, but the election was, and, and then of course, uh, the racial tensions that are, that have been, you know, at the forefront of everybody's mind, thoughts and conversations. Um, it felt like just when you started to get your feet underneath you with one issue, the next one came. And I don't know all of your dynamics about what kind of communities you serve in and the ethnic diversity of your communities. And so you probably all felt this differently. I don't know the politics. I mean, I think I generally know what the Northwest politics are, but Oregon is probably diverse, just like even New York is. And um, I think I found myself having to speak a lot to our people about um, where, what are you feeding yourself with? Where is most of your energy and your attention going? during the course of the day. If you're listening to the news 23 hours a day and doing 20 minutes of devotionals, you don't have a chance. Like you just don't because that stuff is so formative. It so shapes the narratives that we're telling ourselves and the stories that we're believing. And scripture presents this narrative, which is that there's a kingdom that's advancing and it advances at night when people can't see it growing and it advances with wheat and tear tares growing at the same time. It's a mustard seed. It's the smallest seed. But when it comes to full fruition, it's going to be the largest thing you can possibly imagine. All of that, right? And then we have this kingdom of God, which is the upside down kingdom of surrender and serving and sacrifice. And then you have the kingdoms of the Republican Party and the kingdom of the Democrat Party, which is all about power and control and influence and doing whatever you can at any expense to win. And then you have these kingdoms uh, that are surfacing in the conversations on racial tension. And then you have the arguments of, over the issue of COVID, which is also obviously so sorting through all of this. It's been important for me to daily um, settle my heart in God's word for the purpose of uh, reminding myself of the kingdom of God. It's already, but not yet. It's here, but not fully. And helping my, and, and reminding myself of the need to see. It. I'll say one more thing. I know I'm just kind of going on. So I want to say one more thing and see if anyone else has a question. I'm, I'm discipling one guy one on one right now. And he deals with severe depression and anxiety, and he really doesn't sense God at work. And he used to be a strong believer, and he's losing his faith. And one of the things I, I said to him is, you know, when you feel distant from God, our tendency, because we're so individualistic, is to look inward for evidence of his activity, for evidence of his um, work in, in, the, in, our, in us. And I challenge him, instead of looking inward, lift up your eyes and look outward. And ask the spirit to help you see God, to help you know, God, where are you at work already in my neighborhood, in my family, in the world around me? Ask him to show you the places that he's already faithfully at work and then join in on his work, you know, get in on his mission. So um, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but, but that and then and then finding community where you can get it. I know it's hard to get. I'm a I'm a I'm an extrovert. So this has been tough. But wherever you can get with people in whatever safe distance that needs to be, go for it. Anyone else have any uh, questions or thoughts? And I can keep talking, but I want to make sure that whatever's coming to your heart and your mind. Look like, feel free to unmute if you guys want to. It looked like there was a couple of people looking to unmute, but I didn't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I do have one thing. You said something. You said, uh, well, you said a lot of things, but you said fall in love with the problem before you fall in love with the solution. Can you like unpack that a little bit more um, when, it, when it comes to, is it like this idea of embracing the problem 
sitting in it? Does it have, is it tethered to lament? Um, anyway, I don't want to put yeah. words. Yeah. It, it, falling in love with the problem is, is my way of saying as leaders, we need to be passionate about why we exist, not the solutions we've come up with to accomplish things. So what at our core is our mission, you know? And, and so I think um, a lot of times, like I'll use an example that some of your churches may stay, still do and it may still work, but for a long time, the church's solution to biblical education was Sunday school, right? Most of us grew up in churches where Sunday school was normative, but after a period of time, um, and this, this is maybe good or bad, I guess it depends on how you feel about this, Sunday school has mostly gone away. I mean, I grew up in a time where I was in church Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, midweek service. You know, I, I was in church four times a week. And now most Christians aren't in church four times over the course of three months. You know, so it's like we can curse this generation. We can shake our fist at them and we can stick to our guns. But at some point when you won't love the problem, which is what do we have to do? to reach people and release people into who God's created them to be. But instead you're so in love with your solution. And that's the hard part of leadership is leadership is destroying your own solutions. But if you lead long enough in the same place, eventually you're going to have to tear down things that you built up just so that you can move forward, you know? And so I think um, that having that, you know, leadership, one of my favorite leadership books is called Adaptive Leadership by a guy named Ronald Heifetz. Not, he's not a, it's not a Christian leadership book, but he's just a leadership guy. And in it, he gives one of my favorite definitions of leadership. He says, leadership is the art of failing people at a rate they can handle. Leadership is the art of failing people at a rate they can handle. And here's, here's what he means. He's not talking about, of course, in our circles, you might think of like moral failures. He's not talking about that, of course. What he's saying is, is that when you lead people, leadership is always about leading people into change, right? Leading people into something new. You're always moving forward. Well, we tend to say people resist change, but people don't resist change, he says in the book. People resist loss, and change feels like loss, and sometimes it really is loss. And so what he goes on to say is that people look to leaders to lead them into safety and security and victory, and that's been throughout history, whether it's on the battlefield or whether it's in sports or politics or anywhere. But when leaders lead them into change, it feels like they're leading them into loss, not security and victory. It actually feels like a betrayal. And so one of the, one of the skills of leaders is being able to uh, fail people's expectations at a rate that they can handle. Don't go too fast. Don't go too slow. Make sure you understand the people that you're leading. But to do it in a way that always is in service to the mission and the vision. And so when I was saying fall in love with the problem, and not the solution. It was ultimately, we're here to make disciples. Nothing else matters. And if making disciples involves traditional youth group services, good. But if it doesn't, then who cares? Because youth, youth group services are not sacred. You know, Sunday school was not sacred. Those things are not sacred. Those things are only as useful as, or only as good as they can help us advance uh, the thing that matters most, which is making disciples. So I don't know if that helps. And I know that's not Center, central to the topic we have every day, but. No, that was good, man. I saw you on mute, Jeff. Were you going to say something? I was. Um, I have a question. In this season, how have you, I guess, reshaped your habits and your routines um, that, that has been positive? Yeah. Well, man, I wish that my health habits were reshaped a little better. I will say that I've struggled with that. I've really struggled with that because I was a guy who would go to the gym. Not uh, Clearly, I'm not like an athlete or a, a gym rat, but I would go enough to, to be able to uh, keep my blood pressure under control. Um, but, you know, that's all gone up here. I don't know if your guys' gyms are open or not, but that's all shut down here. Um, so that's one area that I've struggled. But I think one of the things that I've got out of this time that I'm super grateful for is really more of a focus on some family devotional time. Um, and just getting into the routine of getting my girls together every morning before we get off to our days and do things like that. But one of the struggles has been like finding the rhythm of work. Um, and I don't know what all your guys' experiences have been like, but you know, we had to shut down our office uh, for pretty much a few months. 
And so I began to like have to, re and, and all of our meetings basically went obviously to Zoom and we had to meet more often. And we were gathering our leadership team in the evenings a lot. And you normally I keep the evenings open for my family. So I just had to be aware in this season that if I'm going to give this chunk of time that I normally give to my family to the church, that I have to recapture that time somewhere else. Um, and then I've just been really diligent of maintaining a regular habit of um, reading multiple devotionals. Um, I, I read basically from four, to, four short devotionals every day. Um, I read from um, the Songs of Jesus by Tim and Kathy Keller. Um, I read from their, their same, they wrote one also on Proverbs, um, New, New Morning Mercies by Paul David Tripp. And, uh, and then one actually that my stepfather wrote. So um, for me, it's been a lot of just maintaining that sort of um, regular reading of scripture, finding time to pray, um, taking up, taking advantage of like moments in the car, driving to places to pray instead of listening to music or listening to a podcast. Um, and then intentionally discipling a few young men over Zoom this whole year. I felt it was so important for me to stay mission focused. And so I gathered like three or four guys, men that were new to our church who were very biblically illiterate. And we just went through the gospel of Mark uh, all, all year long. We just finished it. And it was a, just an amazing life-giving thing for me. So um, I think that's, you know, that's certainly uh, some things I've done. Someone sent me a question. What would the youth group look like if we didn't do live stream or Zoom? Is meeting face-to-face -face old or just a season? I mean, I guess I, I, I've picked youth group a couple of times as an example of a, a solution only because I think it's ubiquitous. I think everybody does it. Um, I, I'm by no means saying, I mean, we still do it here at my church, so we haven't abandoned it or anything. But we have talked a lot about what that environment should look like. And I've always felt like youth ministry should be less of a lecture environment and more of a laboratory environment, um, less of a 20 minute talk and then go do it and more of a Hey, here's what the scripture says. Let's try and do it together right here, right now, while we're all together. So let's do let's let's do group scripture reading and, and let's let's learn together and let's grow together. Let's have guided prayer time. Like, you know, we challenge students to do spiritual disciplines, but we never create an environment within which they can actually try out their spiritual muscles, so to speak. And then we just say, go home and do it. And then they're isolated with nobody there to give them feedback or help them or strengthen them. And you know, in high school, I, it was one thing to read about the inside of a frog in my biology book. It was another thing to go into the laboratory and cut that frog open and see it. And so I think there's a lot of ways that we can rethink youth ministry. So one would be moving from lecture to laboratory, and the other one would be moving from a large group to just just small group um, where people are known, where there's meaningful relationship, where students are discipling other students and led by other leaders. Um, so, no, I don't necessarily think youth group is just a season. That's not what I intend to say. But I do think um, this season has, we've had to pause everything. And so what I'm encouraging you to do is instead of just saying, I can't wait to unpause, ask good questions right now. Like really assess and diagnose what, what are we doing? Has it been working? What are the metrics for making disciples within our local church youth ministry? Are we mobilizing students to live on mission? Is there evidence that they're carrying their faith into their schools? And if so, what does that evidence look like? And how do we equip them better to do so? That's good. And I, and I think uh, the, the challenge, and I'm trying to think of how, how a, a kids worker could apply that too, because um, I actually think that kid pastors and kid workers, you guys do a really great job with that laboratory feature. Um, mm -hmm. And that I was always learning from our kids pastors whenever I was in student ministry of that uh, actually practicing those things in that type of environment. Um, you, I'd love to get your take on how you disciple. I say, you know, I, I use words disciple and apprentice interchangeably. Um, some might use the, the term mentoring. Um, what, so why, why Mark is because it's the shortest of the gospels uh, and how, cause, cause th this is something that I would say is a failure on the American church, a glaring failure within the last 50 years. We have not discipled well. Um, we've become disciples, maybe even 
it's a a buffet of discipleship, if you will, where yeah. we have we have almost almost that I'd like to say syncretistic uh, or syncretism has taken place even within the church. But how as as youth and kid workers and those and some even who will be watching that might just they may not be they may be in the business world they might they might be vo- a volunteer in the church or or whatever what does it look like what is there a paradigm how do you kind of approach that um with people yeah so um i think i have a bunch of thoughts jumping around in my head right now but with kids ministry and with youth ministry i think so much of it especially when the whole family is part of the church is is actually coming alongside the parents and helping them to see themselves as the primary disciple makers in the lives of their students. Now, I know that doesn't always work that way because you probably have students who come from homes where there's no one else who is a believer. So that's a whole different scenario. Um, But I I do think that the idea of doing youth ministry directly to youth and somehow bypassing family ministry and same thing with doing ministry directly to kids and bypassing the families is a mistake. So one of the things I'm always challenging our youth pastor and our kids pastor to do is to resource our parents well for the purpose of follow up uh, on Sundays after they get their lesson, after they teach something. One of the things we've done this year more than ever is we sync up our Sunday morning sermon series with what's being talked about in the youth service and what's being talked about in Trinity Kids. And for us, it just creates hopefully these lunch table and dining room table environments and, and, and with conversations can happen. So I think there's a lot of that. But. Um, you know, you talked about the church's failure in the area of discipleship. I think one of the things we have to just own up to is that being educated, being credentialed, being called is not, does not mean you've been discipled. Those are not synonymous. And there are, I think one of the breakdowns in the local church when it comes to making disciples is that candidly, a lot of our pastors have not been discipled. They've never been in a disciple making relationship. They don't even know what it looks like. So, you know, Discipleship is not a program. Now, that doesn't mean that programs can't facilitate a discipleship strategy, but discipleship is life on life. Man, I'm going to make room in my life for you, and and I'm going to inconvenience my social rhythms, and I'm going to inconvenience my space, and I'm going to share my life um, just wholeheartedly with you as Jesus did with his 12, and it's not going to be this sort of like, here's the program and the structure through which you go. And I, I, so I get it. In kid ministry and youth ministry, there are some unique challenges because of safety policies and the amount of time you can spend with kids. And I, I get that. And you got to follow all of that. But instead of just thinking, how do I get teenagers into my life to disciple them? You might need to start thinking, how do I get that whole family into my life uh, so I can start discipling them? So for us at Trinity, we define discipleship as moving from unbelief to belief in the gospel in every area of our lives, changing what we love and how we live. I'll say that one more time. We define discipleship as moving from unbelief to belief in the gospel in every area of our lives, changing what we love and how we live. And that order matters because until we change what we love most, it's impossible to actually change how we live for uniquely Christian reasons, right? So this is where we kind of dip into gospel fluency, which you guys have probably heard me talk about and that I'm passionate about, which is you can get kids to behave without actually changing what their heart loves most. If you have a student in your youth ministry who loves approval most, then you can actually leverage their heart idol to get them to be an ideal youth group kid. But the problem is, is all you're doing is strengthening the muscles of their heart idol so that when they leave your youth ministry and they go off to college and they still love approval more than Jesus, well, now they're going to go a totally different direction, aren't they? And we're going to sit back and go, ha, ha, another one, you know, walked away from the faith. But the truth is, is we're not really good at disabusing people of their heart idols and, and, and replacing it with a love for Jesus. And that's where gospel fluency and preaching the gospel over and over and over and lifting up Christ from every text. That's where that matters so much. So I think we have to stop thinking of discipleship as something that the church does or a ministry of the church or a program of the church or a budget line item. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's like, it is why we exist. I mean, it's the only reason why we exist, which is to make, to make disciples. And, and when we talk about discipleship, for those of you who are nervous thinking he hasn't said anything about evangelism, uh, we actually think of discipleship as pre-conversion and post-conversion. So pre-conversion discipleship. So we talk about who are you discipling to Jesus? And then post-conversion, who are you discipling in Jesus? 
Because think about it. Jesus discipled the 12 for three and a half years. When were they actually converted? It's arguable, right? Maybe when, you know, look at, let's just narrow it down to Peter. When was Peter converted? Was it when he said, you are the Christ, the son of God? Maybe, but in the next verse, Jesus called him Satan. So that's not a great moment. You know, was it, was it, you know, while Jesus was still walking the earth or was it, you know, Jesus or Peter failed him at the cross? Uh, was it in the room in John 20 when Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit? Was it John 21 where Jesus restored Peter? And then we get to Galatians 2 and Paul still has to rebuke Peter because he's not living in line with the truth of the gospel. So, of course, you know, I'm not making an argument that Peter wasn't converted by Galatians chapter 2. But what I'm saying is, is it's not quite as neat as evangelism and discipleship. It's for me, it's all discipleship because discipleship, remember my definition, moving from unbelief to belief in the gospel in every area of life. So it's a lack of belief in the gospel that keeps us outside of relationship with Christ. But it's a lack of growing and deepening belief in the gospel that keeps us from growing in Christ. And so we don't think of it as evangelism and discipleship. We talk about discipleship as pre-conversion discipleship, post-conversion discipleship. It doesn't matter what your language is. My concern is don't think of evangelism in terms of a, um, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for, an exchange, a... Um, Hmm. There's a specific word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Basically, you pray this prayer and you get into heaven. A transaction. Don't think of evangelism as resulting in this transactional moment. It's, it's, you know, some of you know exactly your moment of conversion. You're like, you're like Paul. You're knocked off your horse. But some of you are like Peter. You don't actually know your exact moment of conversion, but you know that over time you've fallen in love with Jesus and now you belong to him. So, um, I don't know. I feel like I went on there. But uh, hopefully that somewhat answered your question. <laughs> that was good, man. That was gold. I, I'll come back around to a couple of practices uh, that I'd like to hear. But Brogan raised his hand, and Johnny's unmuted. I don't know if Johnny had a question, too. But let's go Brogan, then Johnny. Yeah, I like using the raise my hand feature because I feel like a little kid again. Like, teacher, teacher. Um, <laughs> Uh, so first off, that was like, so good. What you just said. Uh, it's kind of funny. I'm Tom Bachman, who's also on the zoom call. He's across the table from me. We've spent all morning talking about, um, discipleship and evangelism and how like that, that dude, you're like blowing my mind. It's cr some of the stuff you said, we've literally been talking about for three hours. It's crazy. But I had a question because you had talked about reaching your students and their families and I, I, I agree, I think that's great, but I, over 50% of my students don't come to church with their families. Mm. And so what does that look like? Uh, because for the, yeah, for 35%, like, so yeah, for 20 kids, I have their families in church. I can minister to the families. I've had dinner with those families. I've gone to plays with those families. Like I've had a relationship with those families but I have 45 to 50 other kids that their families are not a part of the church at all. And so how do you, what does that then look like? Do you still try to minister to the family? What is, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Hey, well, first off, I want to affirm that you have that many students that you're connected relationally with that many students who, whose parents don't, don't go to church. That's incredible. It means you guys are doing something right when it comes to being an environment that's safe for people to come and belong before they believe. So I think that's really cool. Um, I, I don't know that I have a silver bullet answer for you. And maybe someone in, in this chat has some better insights than me. I do know this. Um, you know, Paul talks about spiritual fathers and by implication, spiritual mothers. So I, I do think that there's, you know, this generation, I think, especially we need spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers in the lives of these of these students. And, and maybe that's one, one thing, one way that it begins to shape and look is that you begin to identify people in your church who can be spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers to these children who don't have parents who love Jesus. The other thing I would say is I would continue to do everything practical I can to serve those families and to make sure they know who you are. And I don't think any parent um, gets tired of getting a letter, a handwritten note in the mail of you bragging on their kid. Um, because first off, it never happens. <laughs> um, and secondly, it's like every parent wants to think they're doing a good job. 
You know what I mean? No parent sets out at it thinking, I want to be a crappy parent. Like everybody wants to be good at it and they realize it's just about the hardest thing to do. Um, and so one of the things I would encourage you, Brogan, to do is to set up a regular schedule where you're handwriting, maybe you're doing this already, so, but where you're writing handwritten notes to these parents and you're just, you maybe in some cases you're introducing yourself. Hey, my name is Brogan and I have the privilege of, of leading a group that your, your son has come out to a few times and we just, and, and be specific. One thing I've noticed about him is like, he's got a great sense of humor and, um, you know, I know you guys, I'm sure you guys uh, are doing everything you can to help him and, you know, love him and grow him. And if there's anything I can ever do, you know, to help you guys, I want to do that. Um, keep informing them as much as possible. Keep them in the loop, find ways, you know, it may have to be snail mail if you don't have email addresses or phone numbers for the parents, but I would just say work so hard at staying relationally connected, keep that bridge open and uh, have a specific plan for letting the parents know what a privilege it is to know their children and what you think is so cool about their kid. Cool. Um, Johnny, or did Johnny bounce? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, there he's good. I got it. Okay, go. And then uh, Jason raised his hand. <laughs> So in the season of COVID, uh, you guys talked about uh, discipleship as you be for either be for Sean or David. Um, but how would being disciple students on a one on one on a one on one basis look like in this season? Like, how do you meet with students? How can it be effective? Um, is Zoom more effective than face to face? Like, uh, what are you guys thoughts about that? I don't think anything is more effective than face to face. Um, but I do think that your church probably has a safety policy in place as far as what you're allowed to do. And I don't even know what your rules and restrictions are right now. Um, as far as social distance and being around kids, like our youth leader right now could not just go get burgers with kids and sit at the table with them. They just can't do it right now in New York where I live. Um, you know, I don't know if it's like this in Oregon, in New York. It's it's a tough place to do one-on-one -on -one ministry with minors. Um, there's basically, it's just there's not an allowance for it in our church safety policy. So even Zoom, uh, a leader could not chat one-on-one -on -one with a minor. Um, it, we would so so that's not to say that that's not to say your question can't be answered. It's just to say like for us it has to be at least one-on-two, um, and so. You can still do that, obviously. I think there's a variety of ways that you can do it. It, it could just be a simple like, um, hey, let's connect uh, once a week on Zoom just to catch up and just talk about life. And it doesn't have to be a Bible study. It doesn't have to be. It could just simply be let's keep the relationship alive and, and let's, you know, let's. how can I be praying for you? I mean, it can be really easy. Like you guys probably have a lot of things on your plate. You don't need to prep for eight different discipleship conversations. Like that's a lot of prep. Instead, if you just come in thinking, I just want to um, understand who this kid is, who this teenager is. I want to ask questions. I want to get to know them. I want to see how God created them. I want to help them understand what it can look like for them to bear God's image. Um, and then just, just ask the Spirit to give you those opportunities to speak the gospel to them, to challenge the different things in their lives that are going on. So I think um, my encouragement to you would be to, to try and do it in, in one-on-twos or one-on-threes not just for safety policies, but also because I think, you know, the, the students need multiple people speaking into their lives. You know, years ago, youth ministry's whole philosophy was you needed one leader for every five students, which was hard enough, right? That was like really hard to get in most cases. And then the guys down at Fuller uh, Youth Institute kind of flipped it. I think it was Chap Clark who actually was the first one to say, you actually need five, uh, five adults for every student. And what he wasn't saying was that's the number of people you needed in the room at your youth service. What he was saying is that every kid needs five adults fighting for them. Uh, five, you know, and this, this doesn't have to mean that they know them super well or that they have a great relationship with them, but just that they know their name and that they say hi to them when they see them in church and, and just the significance of students being connected to the next generation. So I'm big, I'm big on trying to create discipleship conversations uh, that, are, that have people sitting in circles um, I also, uh, now I do some one-on-one -on -one discipleship, but it's always with young, it's always with men. 
And it's almost always because they have some sort of crisis in their life that I'm trying to walk them through. But what I'm always trying to do is gather men into smaller groups for the purpose of just doing life together. Um, and we're creating a discipleship strategy at our church right now that we were supposed to roll out in 2020, but we're, we've had to hold on to it until 2021. And it's just three stage discipleship process of come and see Jesus, connect and be you and commit and lead others. And we're, we've been working through what is that final stage of commit to lead others look like? And for us, it's going to look like a high level of training and a high level of accountability, but very low level programming and structure. So we're not going to be um, having signups for groups. We're not going to be announcing leaders. Really what's going to be is because of the training, the ongoing training that these individuals are receiving and the accountability that's in place, they're supposed to basically go find their own group. Nobody's going to be given a group. You go find people that need Jesus and you start fighting for them. You start feeding them. You start pulling them in. You start meeting with them. And it can be a pickup basketball game on Saturday nights. It can be coffee on Tuesday mornings. It can be uh, Monday night football. Like it can be a lot of different things. But the point is, is who are you sharing your life with and how are you helping them move from unbelief to belief in the gospel in every area of their lives? And so that, that, as a leader, I like things that are cleaner and neater and more measurable than that, but I'm just not sure that's working. I'm just not sure that the traditional church small group model makes disciples. And I'm not saying it doesn't anywhere. I'm sure it does some places, but a lot of times, you know, it just creates smaller Bible studies. It creates people who are more inner, inner focused than ever, but now they're inner focused in a smaller circle. So it's worse. Um, and you have people leading them who, who actually are not disciple makers. They're just, they're generous and they have the gift of hospitality and maybe they like to study the Bible, but they actually don't know how to disciple people. So we're trying to, we're trying to do something that I've only really seen done well in Pi Alphas. Um, and I'm not sure we're going to be able to do it, but we're going to give it a go. <laughs> and uh and we realize this is not a 10 month thing this is a 10 year thing before the culture really probably develops and that is one thing if you're trying to shift from a program focused discipleship model to a life on life do not think you can pull this off in 10 weeks or 10 months like you got to commit yourself to the long haul it's going to be painful it's going to take time um to really get into it so i think jason also had a question yeah, Dave. Um, so I want to shift it from an overall just youth, <clears throat> excuse me, um, looking at youth to actually being the leader of leaders. And I have a question about that. So one of the things that, um, you know, I've always been taught in leadership is that um, to to lead by Christ, right? And, and surround those those leaders that you have around you because now they become and they grab their 12 and whatever. You get where I'm going with that, right? Is that you multiply yourself more by really investing in your leaders. And so that's one of the things, you know, that's how I lead. But then that's really during COVID, how I've really shifted is really pouring into my student leadership and leadership and to, to, to where I take some of that stress off of me and really utilizing them into their potential. And so, um, but one of the things that it's been really difficult during this season. So let me give you a little, my story is that I came here, right before the lockdown so i mean i pretty much came to to portland christian center and then i got put on lockdown so i didn't really have time now that's been given to me over some time but um one of the things that's been probably the most difficult and and is um if you don't lead leaders well they'll find their own vision they'll find their own ways and they'll constantly they'll split off or they'll go do whatever if they're not getting told that vision constantly and so probably the most difficult thing right now is constantly having that vision out in front of them, staying out in front of them. Because like you said earlier, um, you could have one month where it's all right, we're doing this. And then all of a sudden, man, they come up with a new restriction and now you've got to shift all of this and you got to be the dude who gives them all the bad news and so on and so on. And so how are you staying ahead of your leaders? And I know you're a senior pastor now of your church of constantly having that vision in front of them. So, so that you're, you're leading them um, towards new directions, even when these times are hitting of restrictions and all that, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have to leave around one, guys, so I'm not being rude. I just have another meeting, okay? <laughs> it's a, that's, you know, 
I wish I could say I think I'm crushing that. I'm I'm not sure. I don't know if I am. I mean, um, I think one of the ways that I try to lead with vision is by just every conversation we have, I'm trying to bring it back to the same sort of stuff. I'm trying to be consistent with my language. I'm trying to embody it. I'm trying to live it out. I mean, you can't lead leaders with vision if that vision doesn't eat you up. You know, like if it's not everything that, that you're focused on. And so our vision at Trinity, our vision statement is to see gospel transformation in every area of our lives and in every life in our area. Gospel transformation in every area of our lives and in every life in our area. And so I actually don't do as good of a job as I should probably about, I should say that every week. Don't you think like from the pulpit, like I feel like I should be saying that either in the announcements or, or, you know, we do video announcements. I don't do them, but I, f I feel like I could do better with that, but I do know that's the right thing to do. So I'm kind of telling you more as a, this is what you should do. Not so much. This is what I've been doing very well with. Um, but I think a lot of it is leading with language. I'm a big language guy. So I think language has the ability to shape culture. Um, especially if it's understood and shared and lived out. And then I think one of the things I do with leaders is there's an appropriate, there's an appropriate level of, okay, so in this season, um, I think some of the things I've learned about leadership during crisis, you have to communicate more than ever. Like you cannot withdraw. People need to hear from you. And it was so important to communicate more often than ever. Um, to the church. I was sending a video message to the church every week. I mean, I know pastors that were posting video devotionals every day. So whatever that looks like for you, communicate more than ever. And then I think another big thing is, is Andy Crouch wrote a book called Strong and Weak. It's a great leadership book. And in this book, Strong and Weak, what it's really about is what is the appropriate level of vulnerability in a leader? Like we know we need to be vulnerable. But sometimes leaders are vulnerable to the point that they weaken their team or they're vulnerable to the point that they actually hurt the people they're trying to serve. So, for example, every morning, the president gets briefed of all the biggest crises around the world, all the things that like terrorist threats and all these scary things. Right. If he left that meeting and got in front of a camera and told all of us all the not so stuff that's happening in our countries, in our communities, None of us would be able to function. Like, we can't bear the weight of that because we're not, the le we can't do anything about that. And so one of the things I had to really deal with in this season is who am I transparent with and at what level? I do think it was important during COVID to be transparent about the fact that I feel the weight of this. Like, you don't always have to be this strong leader who's like, we're better than this and we're going to break through this. And we're going to, at some point, you have to be honest and say, I, I see people getting sick and I have, I know people that are dying and people are losing their jobs. And I want you guys to know that I feel this, but to go past a certain line and to kind of lose it in front of people with transparency and vulnerability, uh, vulnerability, it actually hurts them because they can't do anything to solve the problem that you are feeling, right? They're, they feel more powerless now than they did before you had your moment of transparency. So that's one of the things with my leaders that I had to struggle with. What do they need to know? What don't they need to know? You know, it's the whole thing of like everything that's said, everything that is said needs to be true, but not everything that's true needs to be said, right? And so just being able to, as a leader, walk that line and even communicating to the church about what we're doing and where we're heading and being honest about saying, this is what I think we're doing. And I use that language a lot. Here's, here's where we believe we're headed, but we just want you to know that the situation is fluid. And so a lot of it was an honesty to my leaders to say, I'm leading and I'm working hard, but I also want you to understand that we're leading in unprecedented times with, uh, with a lack of information. Um, everybody's do going through this for the first time. And then another big thing I did with my leaders, Jason, especially my pastors, is we really leaned into spiritual leadership reading. So not more skills, but more spiritual. So um, Paul David Tripp just released a book that I highly recommend, simply called Lead. And we're going through it as a team right now. And it is just like wrecking our world because it's so easy in crisis to double down on your leadership skills and forget the spiritual aspect of leadership. And, you know, we've had this whole thing in New York recently with Carl Lentz. And unfortunately, things like that are happening all the time everywhere. And as I read this book by Paul David Tripp, I just felt like 
this is what every pastor needs to remind themselves of every day. He's got a chapter in there on spiritual warfare, which I don't know about you, but I've always kind of shied away from that because it's always been weird when I've been around it. But the way he talks about it is so normal and so necessary, and it was so helpful for me. And one of the things he said is that the number one tool that the devil uses to distract and disable and um, ruin Christian leaders is ministry. The number one tool he uses against ministry leaders is ministry. And that ministry in no way protects us from the things that will destroy us. And anything, it puts us on the front line of the things that are warring over our hearts. And how we need to be so mindful of the spiritual warfare that's happening for our lives and our families' lives in our church and our community. And we got to be more than just skillful leaders who have read some good leadership books and know how to cast vision and know how to come up with values. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm down with all of that. I, I think it's all important. But at the end of the day, God's really challenged me this year. Is like, as John Piper talks about in his book, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals, he, call, he says that the pastor should be the lead panter. Pants, who pants after God? That no one should pan after God and hunger after God and thirst after God uh, like we do. And I was so convicted with that because I thought, man, I'm the lead in this church in a lot of ways, but I don't think that's me. Like, I'm not sure that I, that I have the most hunger and thirst and desire for God. And um, I think that's a big part of it, Jason, is just modeling for the people that you're leading this desperation upon God, lack of not so much a dependence upon me and even our vision. And even the things God's given us to do, but this daily dependence upon the Holy Spirit and this desperation that if God doesn't intervene and if the Spirit doesn't breathe on this, then we're all wasting our time. I just need to let that sit. That was really good. <laughs> Great question, Jason. And broken yours was okay, I guess, too. Um, Johnny, great question, Johnny. Um, Latish, were you gonna were you gonna chime in and say something at all? I thought I saw you like raise your hand or something. No, okay, cool. Um, man, it's one o'clock. I'm sorry, David. I told you, I told you like a half hour ish. <laughs> But man, I could, I, I don't know, man. I could just listen to all of that. Uh, I, I would love if you could answer this last question and then let everybody go. Uh, what's one or two practical spiritual practices you would encourage us to begin? Maybe some of us are doing these things, but um, I, I'm with you. I think when we, when, we, when we decide to ourselves preach the gospel to ourselves every day and um, allow ourselves to be discipled, the rest of those things start to fill in. So what would, um, what would be one or two things you think we should begin as leaders? So one thing I think is just to be a great listener, like just to learn to, because leaders don't listen well, because we got answers, you know, and I'm terrible. I'm the worst at this. As soon as you start talking, I'm thinking of solutions to what you're talking about, but um, sh just forcing myself to shut up and listen and ask a question like this, tell me more about that. Or what led you to feel that way? Help me understand. What do you love about that? What bothers you about that? Like always asking follow-up questions that position them to continue to talk instead of giving me the opportunity um, to talk. And so I think, and, and by the way, I think listening broadly is important. So I listen to lots of different podcasts, including podcasts that are not Christian, not you know, not about leadership, not about discipleship. I listen to a lot of storytelling stuff. I listen to stuff that politically doesn't necessarily align with me, but I want to hear it. I listen to storytellers. I listen to comedians. Um, and what I'm always listening for is what are the things that they're struggling with? What are the questions they're asking? And if you begin to listen to celebrities get interviewed, famous people talk about their lives, you're going to hear gospel uh, inroads over and over and over. So many people who are just unhappy, devastated, they got the world on a string, but they're still a slave to performance and they never feel like they're good enough. And, and you just like, so I like to listen broadly to help me make sure that my sermons are answering questions of a broad representation of our population and not just people who read and think about what I read and think about, right? Keller says that if you only read Christian stuff and re listen to Christian stuff, eventually your sermons get stupid. 
which means not that they're not good. It just means that no one in the room cares about the questions you're answering because it's not the questions they're showing up with, right? That's big with teenagers, by the way. What questions are they actually asking? Um, so I think listening is, is a really big one. And then um, if I were to kind of mention another spiritual discipline, I mean, I've, I've mentioned silence and solitude, um, but I think um, finding the time to go through scripture with other people who have fresh eyes on the passage. So this kind of goes hand in hand with, I guess, my first one. But going through Mark with two guys who have never read the Bible before was like amazing. <laughs> it was amazing because they're asking questions that I never would have seen. And, and they're making me look at the text differently. And scripture is so rich. And we bring so much baggage to our interpretation of scripture. Like you already know what you think that scripture means many times before you read it because of your theological leanings. But then when you have someone who's just like asking the most elementary questions, and you're going, oh, yeah, why is that guy doing this? Or why did Jesus say that? That is really weird. Like, you know, it, it really, I think, so um, get into Bible reading environments where you're reading alongside with people who are at a very different place in life than you, asking very different questions. Cool, oh, man. Appreciate that, bro. I really do. That was good. That was good stuff encouraging hopefully everybody we walk away encouraged and and challenged and all of that so i really appreciate you being a part man and um oh that's your email address i i had a few people message me with some follow-up questions so i thought it might just be easiest for me to post my email address okay cool yeah yeah definitely um thanks man for taking the time we'll have to have we'll have to do something like this you guys enjoyed this yeah. Okay. No pressure. I'm still here. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure at all. Thanks, Darren. Catch you later, brother. Um, okay. Well, that's cool. Maybe we'll have to have uh, we'll have to have David on again. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Appreciate the invite, man. Love you. Love your family. Love you too, brother. I I appreciate you making this space, dude. Well, have a good Absolutely. one. Thanks everybody for being a part. Yeah. yeah. God bless you guys. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. <laughs> Looking good. Thanks, Brogues. <laughs> by the way, by the way, yeah. John, you know that question I had blew your mind. Don't even. <laughs> don't, even don't even with me right now. Don't even. Uh, uh, Get out of here. You can go sit down, grow out your faux hawk again. I don't want to hear it. This is being recorded. <laughs> good. Good. Post it. Post it. Post it. <laughs> I'm still listening. The gospel <laughs> truth. Yeah. Tom's still on. <laughs> We're in the same room. <laughs> I know. We're at Oak Church right now. I same know. Room. I'm I'm like down the street. <laughs> oh, All right. Love it.